My name is Kay Byfield, and this is your Art Speak Studio moment from Art Speak Studio in Dallas, Texas. We offer online and in studio courses in mostly watercolor. And today we're going to talk about the problem that there is nothing new under the sun. So what's an artist to do? In my classes, I give students the opportunity to bring in a photograph that they might use as a reference for a painting that they'd like to do. And we look at the photographs together and we talk about the composition, what the, what the photograph means to them and why they want to paint it. And I try to help students pick reference materials that will be the best for them to give them the highest probability of ending up with a successful painting. I always insist that these photographs should be ones that they've taken themselves or that it's someone else that they know who's a non-professional photographer because I want these uh, photographs to have meaning for them. And if you use a professional photo a photograph, you have copyright issues possibly, but even bigger than that, you don't have the same feeling about the subject matter that you do as when the photograph is your own. In any case, I was really surprised not too long ago when my, one of my students brought in this photograph of an airplane wreck from the 1970s in Iceland. And he wanted to paint it, but what was really surprising to me was I had already seen this same subject painted before. It turns out that this is actually a tourist attraction in Iceland. And it had been the subject of an award-winning watercolor um, that was in the Transparent Watercolor Society competition. I was surprised, especially since I thought it was an unusual subject when I saw the award-winning painting. It just confirms that there's nothing new under the sun. There is no way that you're going to find a subject that no one else has ever painted before. And so the question today is, then how do you stand out from the crowd? What this all means is that as you choose your subject, you need to realize that there may well be other paintings of same or similar subject matter and that you need to find your own way to stand out. In order to do something that really does stand out, you need to know what you're painting, why you're painting it, and what your goals for the painting are. If you're just painting for yourself and you don't care what anybody else thinks and you're never going to enter a, a competition with it, then you can do whatever you want. But most of us like to have other people respond to what we do. In order to get that, our paintings need to be skillfully done, meaning we need to use our, our media in a way that shows expertise. Our paintings need to be authentic to us. They shouldn't be derivative of anybody else's work. They shouldn't, they shouldn't reflect someone else's style. They shouldn't reflect someone else's sensibilities. They need to be something that we care about and mean something to us. And then the last criteria is somehow your painting needs to be distinctive. It needs to be different. It needs to stand out of the crowd. And if you meet those three criteria, you will get into more shows. The problem is that in every competition, there are going to be lots of skillfully done paintings of similar subjects. And the juror is going to have to select among those. So some really good paintings are inevitably going to be rejected. For instance, there will inevitably be several paintings in every show of photorealist presentations of table settings with very shiny or transparent objects like crystal bowls. These are always crowd pleasers because the skill involved is widely appreciated. Because there may be a number of them entered, and the juror will want to include a range of subjects, as other subjects as well, 
some really wonderful paintings may find themselves declined. And if you paint a landmark tourist attraction, imagine how much competition there will be. It isn't unusual for two Sphinx paintings or two Statues of Liberty to be submitted to the same show. And you would never expect that zebras would be a popular subject, but they actually are. All of these common themes result from the fact that we all have common experiences, and so we are drawn to paint similar subjects. Just because you paint something that other people have also painted doesn't mean that you are being unoriginal. It's just that there is nothing new under the sun. This subject may be unusual, but it obviously isn't. Here are two paintings that were selected to show in the Transparent Watercolor Society of America 45th Annual Jury Exhibition. Perhaps if only one had been entered, it might have won an award. So how can an artist strengthen the probability that their work will be submitted to a show? There are several strategies that artists use quite successfully. They can become so identified with a particular subject that no one else will paint it because they don't want to compete with their success. They can find a way to con compose or use the elements of principles of design in a way that becomes identified with them, or they can take a unique point of view in some way. All of these strategies are used successfully by artists so that they increase the probability that they will be accepted into the shows that they enter. Many people have painted alligators over the years, including this classic by John Singer Sargent. These days, we see a lot of paintings by Kathleen Malling as well, and it's easy to see why she's drawn to this subject. Alligators offer a lot of texture. There's a lot of interesting shapes. She goes in for close-ups, and sometimes she even uses arbitrary color, which is suggested here. This particular subject, even though she paints other things as well, but this particular subject is beginning to be identified with her. Here are two more artists who've been creating paintings of similar subject matter in a style that has become identified with them. Like most of these other artists, Deborah Edgerton paints other subjects as well, but she is particularly identifiable by her depictions of Japanese girls in traditional dress. The flat paint application, high contrast, and colors are important elements in this series of paintings. Susan Webb Tregay's paintings in this series also depict figures, but in a highly stylized way, flattened, with high contrast and geometric divisions of space. These are not intended to be naturalistic. With her, it's all about those big flat shapes, so it's very abstract. Robin Jordy says in her blog that she begins her paintings by applying acrylic gesso to the watercolor paper and creating some texture. What that means is that when she applies wash and watercolor spatters to the surface, they sit on the surface. They don't sink into the paper at all. She gets it so that it is all at a mid-tone, and then she wipes away for her lights, and she paints some more into her darks to create large, simple shapes with soft edges because they can't be very defined because of the texture, muted colors, and most of her subject matter are nostalgic. They're old town scenes or ruins. Um, sometimes they're uh, vegetation, but, but there's a unique and identifiable style that she has created. Ratendra Das is known for geometric abstractions of buildings that focus on flat shapes, value, and arbitrary pure color. He is a frequent award winner and his style rests on the way he designs his paintings.
Linda Dahl's paintings are recognized by the low point of view of the figures, the simplified hard edge shapes, and the arbitrary colors. No one else creates simple compositions that look like hers. Chica Brunsfeld originally painted pure non-objective abstraction, but in the 1990s, she started to paint these colorful, fanciful, uh, imagined images of animals and particularly birds that are very um, playful and you cannot help but look at them and, and smile. Miles Bat began his career representationally and very photorealistically, but then he began to gravitate toward invented subject matter with a lot of whimsical shapes, patterns, bright colors against dull colors, all arbitrary. And his paintings too have a tendency to make people smile because they look so playful and childlike. As you can see, there's nothing new under the sun. So artists have to adopt strategies for making their work be identifiable with them and noteworthy in a competition. The ways they do that is to be very skillful using the materials, to do paint things that have meaning for them so that they are authentic to them and are not a, a recapitulation of somebody else's work, and to do something that uses the elements and principles of design in a unique way. If they do that, they substantially increase their probability of getting into competitions. I hope this information was in interesting to you, that it was helpful and useful, and that we will see you again in another Art Speak Studio moment. In the meantime, happy painting. Thank you.